This is the story about the early days of baseball. It is the story of what it was like and how it felt to be a baseball player at the turn of the century and in the decades shortly thereafter. This is also the story of America at the turn of the century and prior to World War I, a time of cobblestone streets and horse-drawn trolleys. It is the story of young man's hopes, his struggles, his triumphs and his failures in what history has recorded as the quiet time. It is about the time when the fate of young men was seen as their own doing and hard work was viewed as the pathway to success. It is about the time of carriages and handsome cabs, and the time when some men looked to the sky. It is about the time in baseball when Ty Cobb would win 12 batting championships in 13 years and had a 371 average in the one year he didn't win. It is about the time when home run champions could win the title with six or 10 or 19. It is about the time of John McGraw, Iron Man McGinty, and Christy Mathewson. The time of Walter Johnson, of Rube Marquard, Tommy Leach, and Honus Wagner. All these were honored in their generation. And were the glory of their times. It is summertime in the year 1896, and William McKinley is campaigning for the presidency of the United States, which now has 45 stars in its flag. His opponent, William Jennings Bryan, campaigning on a platform that will be remembered far longer than that of the victor. They tell us that the great cities are in favor of the gold standard. We will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. A new gasoline machine was occasionally spotted amongst the horse traffic, the contribution of a Mr. Henry Ford of Detroit. A young 23-year-old third baseman for the Baltimore Orioles named John McGraw batted 356 to help his team to their third straight baseball championship. And it was the names of McGraw, Cy Young, and Ed Delahanty, and the like, that sent young boys out to the country fields in quest of baseball's honor and glory. One of these men was Sam Crawford. Sam Crawford, born in Wahoo, Nebraska. And the place of his birth became his nickname in baseball. Sam Crawford, who for 15 years would play side by side with Ty Cobb. We made a trip overland in a wagon with a team of horses. One of the boys, when he got his father to let us take the horse and the team and the wagon, and it was only about maybe 11 of us, 11, 12 of us. But we'd drive along the country roads, you know, if we come to a stream, uh, we'd go swimming, come to an apple orchard, or we'd get apples, or, you know. We'd sleep anywhere. We didn't sleep in a tent half the time. We'd sleep anywhere we could find it. If we were in the fairgrounds, why we'd sleep in some of the buildings or near a barn or anywhere. Come on, I gotta go. <laughs> 
It is June 1899, and New York's popular seaside playground, Coney Island, would play host to the heavyweight battle of the decade, 37-year-old champion Bob Fitzsimmons and the young 24-year-old challenger, James J. Jeffries. I knocked him out of the left hand. I thought I'd missed the punch. I just grazed his chin. And I started to hit him with the right hand, and, and his, his, his hands had dropped, and his eyes were glazed. Instead of hitting him, I just shoved him over. As the new century dawned, baseball would come of age. It became a major sport in the schools and colleges of the nation. The Groton School of Connecticut posed for their team photograph, and their most prominent member was not a player, but their manager, 17-year-old Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The most famous collegian was a great football and baseball star from Bucknell University, Christy Mathewson. He moved immediately to the New York Giants after graduation, and all at once the game received a new respectability. Young ladies could now ask their escorts to take them up to the polo grounds to see the college boy play. Mathewson's roommate for eight years was Richard William Marquardt, nicknamed Rube, because sports writers likened him to the legendary Rube Waddell. Mathewson was called Big Six because he was over six feet tall. He was just a great, great grand fella. He was a wonderful fella, wonderful, wonderful. And he loved to gamble. If you had a dollar in your pocket, he would, never would be satisfied till he got that dollar from you. He always carried a thousand dollars with him because he played crap, poker, anything at all. And he, you could win that thousand dollars if you were lucky with that one dollar. He uh, would stand downstairs in the lobby of the hotel wait for the ball players after they get through breakfast and time to go out the ballpark. <laughs> He'd have a paradise in one hand and a deck of cards in his pocket. He said, let's go up for a little while. I've, I've seen him lose seven, eight hundred dollars in one night. The only film of Mathewson was taken during the incredible World Series of 1905 between the Giants and the Philadelphia Athletics. Manager John McGraw chose the occasion to declare the Giants the 1904 World Champions, even though they didn't win the World Series. McGraw refused to let his team play against the newly formed American League champion. McGraw was criticized by the press and the fans and by the owners of the newly formed league. But he nevertheless raised the championship flag over the old polo grounds. No one seemed to like McGraw in all baseball. No one except his players, Chief Myers. They always call him Mr. McGraw. They never, he's still held in high esteem. He fought for his ball players. You couldn't go around and say, why didn't Myers so and so? And he protected his ball players at all times. Oh, how he hated lies. One time there's a young ball player come around second base and he missed it. The umpire called him out. Mr. McGraw says to him, he says, what's the matter? Didn't you touch that base? He says, I stepped right on it. He says, you know something? That'll cost you $100. He says, any time that man out there said you didn't step on it, you didn't step on it. He says, you missed the base. He says, and don't lie to me. So that was McGraw. McGraw's Giants met Connie Max Athletics in the 1905 World Series, and the ever flamboyant giant manager fielded his team in black uniforms. World Series competition would never again see such an array of pitching performances. For the A's, Chief Bender, Eddie Plank, and Andy Coakley. For the Giants, Christy Mathewson and Iron Man McGinty. Mathewson won the first game three to nothing, but Chief Bender came back against Iron Man McGinty to tie the series. In the final three games, it was Mathewson, McGinty, and then again Mathewson. All shutouts, five games, five shutouts, the Giants winning four. Mathewson's statistics, three games, three shutouts, 27 scoreless innings, 18 strikeouts, one base on balls in three complete games. Chief Myers. Pitchers like Mathewson, I don't think he ever walked a man being wild. I don't believe he ever walked a man in his life. The only time he ever walked anybody was, was experience. This fellow was uh, pitching too fine to him, you know, not letting him get a good ball. But there was never a time that he couldn't throw that ball over the plate. We loved to play for him. We did it, we'd break our necks for that guy. Wonderful character, lovely character, gentleman in every way.
The early years of the 20th century were filled with great national tragedies. In sports, the game of football had moved dangerously close to becoming a weekly exercise of death on a Saturday afternoon. President Theodore Roosevelt led a national outcry to remove the savage brutality from the game. Baseball, too, was made up of a different breed. Men like Iron Man McGinty were capable of pitching both games of a doubleheader and winning them both. Off the field, even the stars of the game had problems when not in uniform. Chief Myers. We were just a second-class citizen. We weren't even worse. We weren't admitted to hotels, that is, first-class hotels. Where baseball was a rowdy game. It was all one thought of. It was just like the, it was like the sailors in Boston. No sailors allowed. We were in that class. You had to have guts or you wouldn't stay there. That's all there was to that, even on your own ball team. The playing conditions were equally bad. Fred Snodgrass of the New York Giants. An umpire would throw out a new ball that went into the stand and that the pitcher would sidestep it. It would go around the infield once or twice and come back to him about like the ace of spades because everybody had in the infield uh, had tobacco juice and dirt. That dark ball, believe me, was hard to see. The thing became almost dark brown black and we kept that ball in play just as long as we could. We used to cut a hole in the center of the glove and, and, and catch the ball barehanded in, in, in that hole. Men were men in my days. They're not men anymore. They're mollycoddles. Perhaps the blueprint of what baseball was like could be found in the public image of New York Giant manager John McGraw. He was known as a vicious spikes flying player who could cut down men equally as well with a sharpened tongue. Rube Marquard pitched under McGraw from 1908 until 1915 finest and the grandest man in the world to work for. He loved his players, he, the players loved him. He was wonderful. Although the newspaper men, they called him Muggsy, and that was the only thing he despised. Anybody called him, he didn't care who it was, he'd take a pop at him, and he couldn't make a stand. The old polo grounds in New York City was historically situated in Washington Heights at the bottom of Coogan's Bluff, the scene of dramatic American revolutionary battles. It was also the scene of 29 years of John McGraw's battles. McGraw had a terrible tongue, and he played no favorites, but he was fair. Hans Lobert played under McGraw. Mordecai Brown was hooked up with Christy Mathis. Score is 2-2 in the 11th inning, and I led off with a double. And Larry Doyle was the next batter, and he sacrificed me to third. Merkel was the next batter, and he hit a real short fry into right field, and I'm on third base. So McGraw at third base says to me, Johnny says, stay here. I says, I'm going in. I said, he's got a poor arm. He's not accurate. He says, stay here. They never had a stopwatch on me. I'd have broken all the world's records running 90 feet. I stood by Jimmy Archer, and I, the game was over, three to two. Sure enough, all of a sudden, the drawer runs out at me, and then he ripped into me something terrific. I didn't dare say anything. Now he said, for being so smart, he said, it'll just cost you $50. So that Monday, <clears throat> oh, I played a hell of a game. I had a new life or something, and I made a couple of plays that helped save the ball game against the Cubs. So uh, when the game was over, we were in the clubhouse, and all of a sudden, my girl opens the door. He says, John, the old real girl, he says, come here, I want to see you. So I went in, and he said, now here, John, he says, for saving that ball game today and making those two great plays, it was $100. The year is 1908, and Orville and Wilbur Wright fulfilled their United States War Department contract by building an airplane that would carry two people, fly for at least 60 minutes, and travel at the speed of 40 miles an hour. It was also the year of perhaps the most controversial play in baseball history. It is known as the Merkel Boner. 
The passage of time has made the play a combination of fact and legend. The main fact, which seems to have been forgotten, was that the play took place almost two weeks before the end of the season. Fred Snodgrass was a teammate of Fred Merkel. Merkel was a substitute first baseman, just a youngster sitting on the bench. Merkel was on first base. McCormick was on third base. Al Bridwell was the hitter. The last half of the last inning with a score tie. We had Al Bridwell at the plate who hit a line single over the second baseman's head. McCormick, of course, scored easily from third. He could walk in. The fact that the game was won and over, Merkel, realizing that, and having done the same thing for day in and day out, the minute he saw that ball safe out in right center, rolling toward the fence, he lit out for the clubhouse, as he had been doing all season long. The crowd began to come on the field, just as they did every day. Johnny Evers, he began calling to the center fielder, Shuley, to go and get the ball. And it was intercepted by Joe McGinnity. So he intercepted the ball and threw it up into the left field bleachers. The ball never got to second base. And by this time, of course, there were 1,000, 2,000 people milling around on the infield. Just, oh, just chaos around there. It went to the present office of the league. Three days later, they came up with a, de a decision that the game would have to be played over if necessary. Why should Merkel have been blamed for losing that, that pennant when we lost a doubleheader to Cincinnati and Kovaleski pitched Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday in Philadelphia and beat us three games? So we lost five games after the Merkel incident. A pennant was lost, but catcher Chief Myers, manager John McGraw, and the entire New York team never blamed Fred Merkel. The smartest man we had on the ball club was the bonehead, Mr. Merkel. Mr. McGraw never consulted anybody on the ball club. In the case of strategy or anything of that sort, he never asked Matty, he never asked me or anybody else on the ball team. He'd say, Fred, what do you think of that? One of the smartest men in baseball. Fred Merkel, what a misnomer. The following year, William Howard Taft would become president of the United States. He would be the first chief executive to initiate a custom that would become part of the opening of every baseball season, the throwing out of the first ball. In boxing that summer, a magnificent heavyweight specimen, 31-year-old Jack Johnson, would return from Sydney, Australia after knocking out Tommy Burns for the heavyweight title. And now, he would be in training for his bout with Stanley Ketchell. My best punch was a right hand uppercut. That's the punch that made Burns drunk and knocked him out. My great thrills was this. Any time entering the ring that I went over in the corner to put Rosam on my feet, then I felt great. Amazingly, the bout would take place the same day as the final game of the World Series of 1909 between the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Detroit Tigers the first and only time two incomparable greats met head to head. Ty Cobb of Detroit and Honus Wagner of Pittsburgh. Wagner was an aging 35. Cobb, a young, brash 22. When it was over, Pittsburgh was the winner for the team championship and Wagner the winner in his battle with Cobb. The Dutchman batted 333 in the series and stole six bases. Cobb batted 241 and was held to but two stolen bases. On the field, there was little to choose between the two. They both did everything well. They could run, field, and hit. Off the field, they were as dissimilar in personality as they were in age. Wagner was loved by everyone. Cobb had to look long and hard to find a friend. Wahoo Sam Crawford was Cobb's teammate from 1905 until 1917. I very seldom mention Cobb, you know, but he never had a friend in baseball. That's a terrible thing, you know. Play up there 20 years and never have a friend? That is not right. Too big a man, too big a star, great ball player, but not the greatest ball player in my book. I think Honest Wagner was the greatest ball player ever lived. But I mean, all around ball player. Cobb could only play the outfield. Honest could play outfield, infield, in. Steal bases, hit, ever throw, wonderful arm. Can do everything. Outstanding. Anybody can do everything around there. It's always outstanding. 
What most people did not know was that Wagner was considered by baseball men almost the equal of Cobb as a runner and base stealer. George Gibson was the catcher for the Pirates in the World Series of 1909 and the man responsible for Cobb stealing only two bases. Now you'd see the big clumsy guy and you wouldn't think he could run a lick. Now he was a big clumsy looking ox when you'd see him. Honestly, he seemed to strive twice as far as Cobb would and faster. His legs seemed to work faster and slide. He was a very elusive on his slide, Honest was. He'd make you believe that he was going one way and he would reverse and go the other and he's got you. Cobb maintained throughout his career that he never purposely slid into a base with flashing spikes. One of his defenders was pitcher Joe Wood of the Boston Red Sox. Ty would cut you down. There's no doubt about that. He'd cut you down. If you didn't give him a spot to go into that bag, give me room to get in there and don't worry. But if you don't give me room, I'll cut you out to get in there. Which is in common sense, isn't it? In the second game of the 1909 World Series, Cobb was on first base. Wagner was at his shortstop position, knowing that Cobb would probably attempt to steal. They eyed each other from the 100-foot distance between them. Showing his contempt, Cobb yelled down to Wagner, Hey, Krauthead, I'm coming down on the next pitch. Cobb was true to his word. Gibson's throw to Wagner was perfect. Wagner's tag came down on the only part of Cobb that came close to the bag. The result? Cobb had three stitches taken in his lip and had several teeth loosened. He was also out. Davy Jones was a teammate of Cobb's during the 1909 series. Well, even Cobb, you know, Cobb could have been an awfully popular fellow. Uh, boy, everybody despised him. His personality was rotten. Wagner was loved by everyone. A protege of Wagner's was Hans Lobert. Real fine fellow. Wouldn't harm anybody. And he was always trying to help the kids. After a double header, you know what he would do? There'd be kids playing out there. He'd go out there and play with those kids. Many a time I saw him out there. Though he was disliked by practically everyone, no one doubted Cobb's courage. He flirted with injury in every game, but he always came back for more. Onus Wagner was the man who set the mold. He, too, was fearless. Rube Marquardt pitched against Wagner for 10 seasons. If we were playing Pittsburgh, and Honus Wagner was playing, and he slid into second base, and he slid in, and he hit that solid, and he slid along about two feet, and that staple cut it right through his sliding pads, that deep, from his knee up to here. That's how deep that was. Players got all around him, and he lowered his pants, and everybody that was chewing the back, I, he took the chew up and patted it. I even gave my chew out of it, put it in, patted it, pulled up his pants and finished the ball game. And we had a doctor, and he put in 26 stitches from here to there. Many a second baseman would pray that his pitcher would give him half a chance by keeping Cobb close enough to first base before a steal. Try as they did, Cobb would be equal to it. Sam Jones was a pitcher for the Cleveland Indians and Boston Red Sox during the Cobb years. Ever Scott used to say, was you ever standing on a railroad track and a freight came coming down there, helter skelter? He says, that's just the way a Cobb seems to come down there. You never knew which way he was going to slide on the left side, right side. He'd slide clear around that base and reach back and get while you're tagging for his legs or his hips. He'd cut you if he was in the way, not necessarily, but if he just said that he was entitled to that bag. If you get cut, you get cut. The first decade of the 20th century was coming to a close, and a new form of entertainment was coming of age, the Nickelodeon. In 1909, the world was also becoming smaller. On his sixth attempt, Commander Robert Peary reached the North Pole. 
and ended his victorious announcement with the words, the stars and stripes were planted and a record left with a piece of the flag. The main party under my command, six men, five pledges, 40 dogs, pushed forward by forced marches to the pole itself, where it arrived the 6th of April, 1909. The stars and stripes were planted and the record left with a piece of the flag. It was the year a young 22-year-old pitcher for the Washington Senators, Walter Johnson, lost 25 games as the Senators finished in the American League cellar. The following year, he also had the number 25 in his record. This time, they were victories. Wahoo Sam Crawford. Here's Walter, he's just a string of a kid, you know, I guess he was only about 20. You know, tall, lanky, didn't have a curve, but he had that fastball, that's all he pitched. And we had, we had a terrible time to get to beat him. He didn't need any curve. But Walter was a wonderful man, too. He was, uh, he wouldn't hit anybody. You know, he was, he was always afraid he might hit somebody. Wonderful guy. Yes. Yeah, he was fast, the fastest I ever saw. Boy, it was like a bullet, you know. It swished. That is a word I use, swish. Whoosh, when it went by you, see? Well, that's the kind of a ball that Walter Johnson pitched. He had a swish. The year 1912 dawned, and in April, there were three major events on the horizon. Teddy Roosevelt was challenging President William Howard Taft for the Republican nomination, and the split threatened a Republican victory in November. And who was the Democratic dark horse Governor Woodrow Wilson of New Jersey? But this was all in weeks to come. Now, all that was on everyone's mind was the maiden voyage of the Queen of the Seas the unsinkable, the Titanic. A few days out of Belfast, misfortune struck the great ship. But an incredible headline reporting the accident put New Yorkers at ease, and their only sadness would be over Christy Mathewson's loss in his 1912 debut, and in discussions over why Fred Merkel quit the team. But then the terrible story of what actually happened stunned the entire world. Mrs. Henry Harris, wife of the famed theatrical producer, was aboard the Titanic. They were starting to fill the boats, the lifeboats. We went from boat to boat, watching them fill them in. Mr. Harris saying to me, let me put you in a boat. And so I said to Mr. Harris, must I go? He said, I can't help myself if you don't. So he picked me up in his arms, and, and as we are rowing off, the people in my boat are screaming, look out for the suction, look out for the suction. I could see five ribbons of light converged into nothing. It went from nothing into the bow to these five ribbons of light, which slowly were four, then three, two, one, then no lights at all. The people were screaming in my boat, saying, look out for the suction, and all I could think of, it, it could only go quietly. The summer moved on, and Woodrow Wilson became the Democratic nominee. The Republican Party split, and two former friends were now bitter enemies. President William Howard Taft won the Republican nomination, and Teddy Roosevelt led the Progressive Party with the words, we stand at Armageddon and battle for the Lord. Six weeks ago, here in Chicago, I spoke to the honest representatives of a convention which was not dominated by honest men. To you who face the future resolute and confident, to you who strive in a spirit of brotherhood for the betterment of our nation, I say we stand the armor, get it, and we battle for the Lord. In baseball, the phenomenal Walter Johnson won 32 ball games as he led the Washington Senators to a second place finish. But 1912 was the year of Smokey Joe Wood, and his 34 victories led the Boston Red Sox to an easy American League pennant. Wood and Johnson were unbelievable. In the early part of the season, Johnson had a winning streak of 16 straight before being defeated. As the season wore on, Wood was challenging that mark. It became inevitable that the cry would arise that Walter Johnson be given the opportunity to protect his winning streak in head-to-head -head combat with Smokey Joe Wood. There were very few pitchers ever lived that had a fast enough ball where it would really rise. And I, I was one of them. Walter Johnson and I were the ones in those days. Now, up at that time, Walter Johnson hit his 16 and had lost his 17th. I had about 11. Well, old Foxy Clark Griffith comes in and Walter Johnson should have the right to defend his uh, record of 16 straight, so he challenged Joe Wood to meet Walter Johnson. And so they advertise us like prize fighters with biceps and triceps and all that stuff. And that is the only time a 
all the time I was there, and I don't think since people have come to the game, the fans were sitting right alongside the third baseline and the first baseline. We were sitting up, instead of sitting on our bench back where the benches are now and where they were then, we were sitting on chairs right up alongside of those people that were along the line. And I won one to nothing that day. And, uh, of course, my God, if he'd had the club behind me, him that I had behind me, he never would have lost a game. I, that's the unfortunate part of Walter's pitching. He, he had a bad club behind him all the time, and I had a good club. Walter to me, my God, he was the, he's the only pitcher that I ever hit against that I didn't know whether I, I swung under the ball or over the ball. I just missed it, that's all. And I don't know how. Sad Sam Jones pitched against Johnson. Oh, he was, he was awful fast. So easy, and that long arm. He had a long arm. His arm almost to his knees, hung down almost to his knees. If you could see his arms hanging down, and you just realize how long they were. Smokey Joe Wood was unbeatable during the 1912 season, and his roommate, Tris Speaker, was considered with Ty Cobb the greatest outfielder in the game. Wood and Speaker roomed together all the years Smokey Joe was in the American League. In 1912, the roommates were phenomenal. Speaker batted 383, and Wood won 34 games. At the season's end, Walter Johnson was asked whether he was faster than Wood. Johnson smiled and said, my friend, there's no man alive can throw harder than Joe Wood. As a pitcher, I was at the top of the heap, right along with the, with the best, Walter yeah. and I. It's unfortunate when my arm went bad right at the peak of my career. 23 years old, and the next year, my I couldn't throw. Otherwise, I'd have, I'd have set a record that they've been talking about yet, probably. Walter Johnson was a 20-year phenomenon. He was faster each year. Hans Lobert. I was a third hitter. The first two batters he hit, hit one guy here, another guy there, broke this guy's ribs. I see two of them going to the hospital. And the first of all, he threw it. Jeez. We hadn't seen that kind of stuff all year, and he was wild. That's why Griffith put him in there, wanting to get control in the next one. And now he's got me two and two, and the third one he threw behind my head. I went, and I just froze. They were hit me to kill me. So I says, Walter, I says, there's the plate, and I says, I'm over here. I couldn't hit him with a pole. The World Series of 1912 would see the Boston Red Sox face the New York Giants, and Smokey Joe Wood and Christy Mathewson would lead their respective teams into the most unbelievable finish in baseball history. Dignitaries from all over the country came for the opening game, and New York's mayor, William Gaynor, threw out the first ball, starting another amazing win streak for Joe Wood. Wood won the opening game, defeating the Giants 4-3. He came back three days later to again beat the New Yorkers 3-1. He was so good that rumor had it that manager John McGraw refused to send his aces, Christy Mathewson and Rube Marquardt, against him. The Giants finally reached Wood in Boston to tie the series at three games apiece. Now it was Christy Mathewson's turn to again be on center stage. He had yet to win in this series. As the Red Sox came up for the last turn, he needed but three outs to give the Giants the championship. There was additional drama. The day before, Teddy Roosevelt had been the victim of an assassination attempt, but now he was out of danger. Mathewson got ready for the final three outs, but it was not to be his day. Fred Snodgrass would make an unbelievable error, just as his teammate Fred Merkel had four years before. I didn't lose any World Series. I never took credit for losing any World no. Series. This error happened in the 10th inning, the first man up in the 10th inning. I did drop that fly ball. Well, I dropped the darn thing. It was so high that this fellow ran it out and was sitting on second base before I picked it up, see. Cooper was the next hitter. He hit one over my head, and I made one of the greatest plays of that whole World Series. Caught that ball. Well, that's one out. Then Matty walked Yerkes with a winning run. And up comes Speaker. Speaker took a swing at that ball, and he hit a nice, easy, foul fly. That the crowd was quiet as a mouse. You could heard a pin drop. I can see Matty yet. Come on, Chief, come on, Chief, come on, Chief, come on, Chief, and Chief never could get there. Well, 
Glenn Speaker, of course, gets a clean line drive over the first baseman's head that scores the man I put on, puts the line that walked on third, and another long fly to right field, and the game's over, and I, I lose the World Series. Joe Wood was the beneficiary of that dramatic 10th inning. He was given credit for his third World Series victory. Christy Matthews is his own fault if that ball was dropped. Because it was right in front of Merkel, and he kept hollering for Myers, and Myers was running all the way down the line to first base. A man coming into a ball always has a preference of taking that ball instead of one going away with the ball out there, and he's running this way, and the other fellow's coming in. Chief Myers was Matthewson's catcher and the man Matty called for to take the foul fly. In a four-year period, two disastrous mishaps kept the Giants from gaining championship honors. Mr. McGraw or anybody on the club never censured Fred Snodgrass. Fred Snodgrass was another gentleman, a very fine fellow. We hold him in high esteem, and everybody on the club did. Manager John McGraw put a finish to the story in his book, My 30 Years in Baseball. Said McGraw, Often I've been asked to tell what I did to Fred Snodgrass after he dropped that fly ball in the World Series. I'll tell you exactly what I did. I raised his salary $1,000. We are in the second decade of the 20th century. Electric lights are commonplace and Thomas A. Edison can reflect on the marvel he has brought the world. And where once the Indian roamed, cities began to appear. This is Chief Wolfrobe, Cheyenne. Chief Shortbull, Sioux. Chief Sharpnose, Arapaho. And as the American Indian disappeared from the plains, he appeared on the athletic fields of the country. Chief Myers, New York Giants. Jim Thorpe, New York Giants. As the 1913 baseball season opened, the newly elected President Wilson threw out the first ball and proclaimed, the great white father now calls you his brothers, not his children, in sending his greeting to the American Indian. The great white father now calls you his brothers, not his children. It gives me pleasure as president of the United States to send this greeting to you, the Indian people. 1913 was the year that perhaps the greatest all-around athlete in history, Jim Thorpe, would return from his great victories at the Olympic Games and be signed by manager McGraw to play for the New York Giants. His roommate was Chief Myers, Jim Thorpe, that was a great athlete, a wonderful athlete. John, he was built like a Greek god. I, gosh, yeah, I roomed with him, you know. When he came back from the um, Olympics, 1912, his deportment wasn't any too good ever since he come back from the... They took those trophies away from him. One time he come in early in the morning, woke me up. He says, you know, Chief, he says, you know, the king of Sweden gave me those trophies. And he says the guy that finished second wouldn't take them. And that broke his heart. One of Shakespeare's quoting again, the most unkindest cut of all. He never got over that. And I started him to drinking. Ed Rausch played with Jim Thorpe in the major leagues. Good ball player, but he couldn't hit uh, right-hand pitching. Couldn't hit that curveball. I don't know, it's like everything else. It's just one of them things that he... Well, he wasn't too good a hitter to start with. And he was fast in that outfield. I used to run him around the ballpark in Cincinnati, and I was pretty fast. But I'd run him around the ballpark just to see him run. I said to him one day, I said, Jim, I said, anybody, when you run those Olympic games, anybody make you run your best? He looked at me and he said, hmm, never saw anybody I couldn't look back at. The baseball players at the turn of the century were superstitious almost to the point of the ridiculous. The most superstitious of all was John McGraw. When his team defeated the Philadelphia A's in the World Series of 1905, they wore black uniforms. In 1911, they would again meet the A's, 
and Manager McGraw, for good luck, ordered the same black uniforms to be worn. McGraw also had another ace in the hole to whammy the athletics. Fred Snodgrass tells about the good luck charm. We were having batting practice. Out of the grandstand walks an individual, tall, lanky, in a dark suit. He said, I'd like to talk to Mr. McGraw. Mr. McGraw, he says, my name is Charles Victory Faust. And uh, a few weeks ago, I went to a fortune teller who told me that if I would join the New York Giants and pitch for them, that they would win the pennant. Well, Mr. McGraw looked at him and being superstitious as most ball players were, he said, well, take off your coat. And he said, here's a glove and the ball and I'll get a catcher's mitt and I'll warm you up. And uh, McGraw would give one signal and Charlie would wind up and his wind up was like a windmill. Well, every different sign that McGraw gave, the ball came up just the same. And there was no speed, and so McGraw finally threw the glove away and he caught him barehanded. And McGraw said, well, he said, uh, we're taking Charlie along to help us win the pennant. Every day from that day on, Charles Victor Faust was in uniform and he warmed up every day this happened. And we did win the pennant. The spring came around the next year and Charles Victor Faust was in the training camp. He warmed up every day in 1912, and again, we won the pennant in 1913. He was again in the spring training camp. He warmed up every day to pitch, and during that season, he became such a drawing card with the fan. They clamored so hard and so loudly for McGraw to put him into pitch that McGraw did put him into pitch, and he pitched one full inning, and he didn't have enough to hit. They didn't score on him. He was gone four days, and we lost four ball games. The fifth day, Charlie showed up. Oh, he said, fellas, I got a pitch today. He says, you, you fellas need me. So he got out and warmed up with this windmill warm-up that he had, and we won, and we won the pennant again. That fall, he said, I'm not very well, but he said, I think if you would prevail on Mr. McGraw to send me to Hot Springs a month before spring training, that I could get into uh, shape and help you win another pennant. But unfortunately, that never came to pass because Charlie Faust died that winter and we did not win the pennant the next year. Another engaging character who played with the Giants in those years was Arthur Raymond, better known as Bugs Raymond. Bugs Raymond would find any conceivable way to get to a nearby bar or tavern for liquid fortification. Thus the reason for his nickname, Hans Slobert. Oh, I remember Bugs. I told him one time I batted against Bugs and he had the best spitball I ever batted against. I said, you, I said, you don't spit on the ball. I said, I said, you blow your damn breath on the ball and the ball comes up here and it's drunk. Manager John McGraw did everything in his power to set Bugs on the straight and narrow path. For Raymond was known as one of baseball's greatest spitball pitchers. Fred Snodgrass was a teammate of Raymond's for three seasons. Well, when McGraw bought the Bugs Raymond, he knew that he was a character and a drinker. McGraw put some Pinkertons on him, Pinkerton detectives. And uh, one day he called us all into the uh, office and he said, I'd like to read you this report on Bugs Raymond. Bugs hadn't yet come into the clubhouse. And he read this report that this Pinkerton man had put in. And Bugs had stopped first at uh, 41st and Broadway, and he'd had a couple of beers and uh, some free lunch sandwiches. And the next stop was, oh, maybe 10 blocks on up. But anyway, by the time he'd gotten to the polo grounds, he'd stopped about 20 different bars and partook of, of beer only, plus the free lunch at these places. And about the time McGraw finished uh, reading this report to us, in walks Bugs, and he confronted Bugs with this with this uh, report, and and Bugs listened to it, and he says it's a damn lie. He says I never ate an olive. It is now 1916. The airplane has come of age, and there is war in Europe. 
In Mexico, the great revolutionary leader Pancho Villa is considered a menace to the United States, and President Wilson sends General Pershing to lead an expeditionary force to seize him. The quiet time is over. In baseball, a young pitcher fresh from St. Mary's Industrial School in Baltimore was being called the best young left-handed pitcher in the major leagues. His name, George Herman Ruth, Babe Ruth. In the 1916 season, he won 23 games. Joe Wood was his teammate. Well, he was just a big hick, a big farmer boy. He come out of this convent area. I mean, he come out of this uh, home there in, in uh, Baltimore. He never had been out at all until the year before. And he just didn't know what it was all about, that's all. He'd been in this home for years. <laughs> he, he was the goddamn man you ever saw in your life. That's all there was to it. When Ruth left the industrial school in 1914, he played for a time with the Baltimore team. He was taken in hand by Jack Dunn, the owner of the Baltimore Orioles. Dunn had a reputation for selecting young ball players and training them personally. Ruth and Dunn were inseparable. When he first arrived on the field with Ruth trailing behind, one of the Orioles yelled, here comes Dunn with his new babe. George Herman Ruth had a new name. Harry Hooper was a teammate of Ruth's. Babe Ruth, he was a most wonderfully built fella. When he came up, he weighed 198 pounds in perfect trim. Slim waisted, big broad shoulders, big biceps. Babe was a wonderful specimen. And he used to, for a number of years with the Red Sox, he never, never drank anything except pop. But he ate too much. He used to have a tremendous appetite. For a while, they used to kid him. A lot of the fellows would have called him the big baboons. He ended up used to make you mad at hell. He challenged the whole club, and Carl May said he looked right at me. Ruth was becoming the greatest pitcher in baseball. He again won 23 games in 1917, and in the following year, he set a consecutive scoreless inning record in the World Series against the Chicago Cubs. Hans Slobert. I am the first major league player that batted against Ruth when he broke in. I was with the Phillies. So we were leading in the seventh inning. So Jack Dunn, I knew him very well. He says, Hans, he says, I'm putting in a young pitcher the next inning, a left-hander. He says, I want you to give me your honest opinion of this young pitcher. I said, all right. Big gangling youth with, he had real thin legs and put part of his body and looked like Hercules. So the first ball he saw was the first batter up. The first ball he threw up. And I said, oh, boy. And I said, that kid's got something. Well, I hit down to the shortstop, and I was thrown out. And on my way back, I had to pass Jack Dunn's bench, and he says, hands. He says, what kind of stuff's that kid got? And I says, fastest I've seen this year. I says, he's really fast. He says, wait until you see him hit. So this was it. This was baseball when the 19th century ended and the 20th century began. And these were the men who played it. It is the story of a time long since gone, never to return. And what it really all adds up to, what it really all means, is that these men were pathfinders, pioneers, with courage and strength and ability, and perhaps most of all, pride. And to those who saw them, and to those who lived through their age, they were giants who walked the earth when the earth was still. All these were honored in their generation and were the glory of their times.